And as you'll see, we observe data in green there, it's trending in a direction that's below the very lowest case that he then predicted. Next slide, please. In 1988, he made another prediction, a famous one in front of Congress. And there, the black line is observation. And as you'll see, his main prediction on the red line, again, no correspondence between the two. Next slide. And here are the IPCC predictions in 1990, set against the observed outturn on all five of the major uh, data sets, <coughs> three terrestrial and two, uh, the green ones there, which are satellite. Once again, you can see the trend is entirely on all data sets, well below the least prediction of the IPCC. Next slide. And you'll see there a comparison done by the RSS uh, controller, uh, Dr. Carl Mears. And he shows the 33 IPCC models in, in pale green there, and the black line is the global temperature change actually measured by RSS satellites. Once again, no correspondence between the two. Next slide. And the same in our very accident-prone Met Office here, mm -hmm. which for years has been forecasting barbecue summers, and if anyone next sees a barbecue summer, can you wake me up? I'm not going to stay here. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, the CMIT-5, these are the latest models, once again against the RSS uh, temperature from the lower troposphere, TLT there. That also is an official slide from RSS. Next slide. And IPCC knows perfectly well that its models and its professors are getting this wrong. Next slide. As you will see here is an enlargement of a postage stamp sized corner of one of the graphs in the fifth assessment report of 2013. You can see the two coloured lines there, the CMIT-3 and CMIT-5 uh, model predictions, and the observations are in black. Next slide. And here again, this is a very interesting one, because the RCP 4.5 is the scenario <coughs> in the Fitness Report that says there will be very, very little uh, influence from CO2 from now on, that we're going to get it under tight control. And yet look at the observed temperature change in relation even to that scenario. And once again, it's trailing along at the bottom. That is an official IPCC graph. Next slide. And this is a comparison between the predictions made by the IPCC in its 1990 first report, which you'll see in red, and the fifth report, which you'll see in green, which I got at because they were trying to make exaggerated predictions of medium-term warming. I said, this will not do, you're going to get caught out if you stick with that, you've got to bring them down. So they did, and they barely overlap now with the <laughs> previous predictions, and as you can see, the actual trend in global temperature is well below those previous predictions. Next slide. Now, the question I'm addressing in this particular presentation is, Houston, they've got a problem. <laughs> Why did their predictions go wrong? Why, in particular, did the climate muddles, as I call them, predict more warming than has happened? Why did they get it wrong? Next slide. Now, this is the official climate sensitivity equation. And I show it to you in this form because this is derivable in this form from the documents of the IPCC. It is the official equation by which you determine how much warming you get per doubling of CO2 concentration at equilibrium. You'll see there the values for the radiative forcing from CO2, 3.708 watts per square meter per doubling of CO2. You'll see the climate sensitivity parameter, lambda zero, which has a, a value of 3.2 to the minus 1, or about 0.313 at Kelvin per watt per square meter. And then you see the only other input <coughs> to this equation is the feedback sum C there in blue and the right, which we're going to look at in the next slide, please. And there you'll see the values for the feedback sum, which are derived from various models in AR4, which is the previous assessment report of 2007, in grey at the bottom there, and AR5 in glorious technicolour at the top, and the values I've separated out so that you can see that we'll use those as inputs to that simple equation, which will allow us to treat the models as though they were a black box. And we have the equation that is our meter for measuring what they are, are saying officially is put into that box, and then we make sure that what we get out is what they say they get out. So we're going to calibrate that equation I've just shown you. Let's go to the next slide. Here again are the various values summarised, and I added at the bottom the CDIP3 models for the uh, 2007 assessment report. 
Uh, they were predicting 3.26 uh, Kelvin of global warming, with upper and lower bounds 2.2 and 4.4 Kelvin respectively. See bit 5, 3.2, and 2.1 and 4.7. Next slide. And now we're going to calibrate that equation by using those inputs I've just shown you, the feedbacks along with the climate sensitivity parameter and the radiative forcing, to see whether we can get out those published sensitivities. And sure enough, we can, both for CMIP3 at the top and for CMIP5 at the bottom. The only real irregularity you'll see is that their central estimates seem a little bit on the high side, and that is the first indication that they're doing something wrong by their own lights. And I'm going to show you what that is. It's the first of a concatenated series of errors by which they have ended up, whether accidentally or deliberately, it's not for me to say, greatly mm -hmm. exaggerating climate sensitivity. Next slide. What we're going to do is look at these errors each in turn. The first one is the exaggeration of the central estimate. And here is just a bit of background. The variance of global mean surface temperature, either side of the 810,000 year period mean, derived from the ice cores in Antarctica by the official paper that integrates those results, which was Jusel et al. 2007, is just 3.3 Celsius, either side of that period mean. It's a very small movement notwithstanding all the huge changes in forcings and astronomical circumstances and meteorites and heaven knows what else that will have happened over that time. The temperature of the planet is near perfectly thermostatic. Yes, you can get ice ages at the bottom end of that range, you can get hot house earth at the top end. And we're somewhere in between, more towards the top end already as it happens. But you don't get much movement. In other words, the climate is essentially thermostatic. Now let's look at this next slide. and This is where we begin to see what's going on. Now this is very interesting, because what you will see here is a non-linear response curve. Would anybody like to tell me what this curve actually is, what kind of a curve it is? Oh, okay. Hyperbolic, thank you. Yeah, this, this man gets a prize, that's very good. It is, of course, oh, our first, first class degree in astrophysics from <laughs> Piers Corbin. Of course, he would know this is a rectangular hyperbolic curve. And that is that curve of time sensitivity against the feedback factors F, the dimensionless feedback factor, <coughs> is hyperbolic because of the way the feedback factors are calculated. And it is therefore this very startling curve. And because of that, if you have a fairly wide range of feedback factors, you see here from 0.23 to 0.74, that translates to an enormously wide range of climate sensitivities, 1.5 to 4.5 Kelvin. And this range of climate sensitivities was first established in the report by Jules Charney for the US National Academy of Sciences and the US government in 1979. And in the AR5, the latest assessment report of 2013, the IPCC has exactly the same interval, 1.5 to 4.5 Kelvin. Billions spent, tens of billions spent, absolutely no advance made at all in <laughs> constraining climate sensitivity to within a lesser interval than the, that huge three degree range. Now the odd thing about this graph is that it is so, that what they're saying is there's such a large possibility of, of, of warming. If you just push the right hand purple line a bit to the right, getting towards one there, you can get 10 Celsius of warming per double the CO2, Murphy 2008, and again 2009, said so we can't rule that out because of this curve. <laughs> now, to me, when you look at the thermostasis I just showed you in the previous slide, there's something odd about that interval of climate sensitivities and, and, and that closeness of the feedback factors to the discontinuity and unity in the hyperbolic curve. So what has gone wrong? In this presentation, I shall be providing you with an indication of the reasons why they are unable to constrain climate sensitivity, and I'm going to show you and them how to do that. Something which has eluded climate science for the last 30 or 40 years. If we go to the next slide and then go backwards and forwards between those two for 10 times, if you would. 
you can see that the reason why they're getting the central estimate so exaggerated is that they're not taking the central estimate of the climate sensitivity from their central estimate of the feedback time, keep doing it, and yet it's good exercise for our gallant <laughs> um, And the, the, what happens is, that because they have this very wide interval of feedback sums, what they should do, because it's the wide interval of feedback sums that leads to the wide interval of climate sensitivity, they should choose as their central estimate of climate sensitivity, a central estimate calculated from the feedback sum. Stop it there. And there is the correct position. And it should, if they were right about the rest of it, be 2.2 Kelvin and not the 3 or 3.2 Kelvin that the current models are predicting. So if you take the 3.2 they're predicting, divided by the 2.22 is right. Already that's a 44.1% exaggeration of the central estimate just because they don't understand the characteristic of a rectangular hyperbolic curve as well as Piers Corbyn. <laughs> Next slide. And thank you, sir, for that gallant job of animating that science. <laughs> Give it a round of applause. It's been a very good <laughs> Now, the second error we're looking at here is the exaggerated estimate they make of the climate sensitivity parameter lambda zero, which to a first approximation is simply the first uh, derivative of the Stefan Boltzmann equation with respect to the temperature and corresponding flux that obtain at what is known as the emission altitude, one optical depth into the atmosphere to about five kilometers up. That's if uh, Ned Nikolov is, is not right, of course. Uh, I defer to him on that, but we're going to stick for the moment with the way they do it, but I think he has a lot to, uh, to say about this. But let's go on to the next slide. Now here, then, is the, uh, the basic flux that you get coming in at that altitude. And that you simply calculate it from the, uh, the sunlight, the, the total solar radiance of 1361 watts per square meter. You need the albedo, I'm taking it approximately 0.3, and then you just use that formula, it gives you the, the flux. Uh, then we add the CO2 uh, rate of the flux, 5.35 times the natural logarithm of 2, it's a logarithmic relation, approximately speaking, that's the official equation for that, 3.708 watts per square meter per W. Add those two together, that gives you the new and amplified forcing before we start doing anything about feedback. Now, in order to do something about feedback, we need to have a parameter that relates the feedback to the temperature change. And we, we do that with uh, looking, first of all, we see that the uh, temperature at the catalyst emission level is about 255 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, likewise, the temperature after you added the 3.7 watts per meter it goes up to about 2.6 Kelvin. So it's it's 256 Kelvin, about one Kelvin above. This is 0.985. They say that it's 0.312 times 3.78. Where do they get this 0.312 from? What they do is instead of taking the flux and temperature at the same altitude, because that's where they are properly related. They say, why don't we take the flux from five kilometers up in the atmosphere and compare it with the temperature at the hard deck surface where we live and move and have our being, five kilometers down here. Mm. Now that is a total abuse of the way that equation works. This device for amplifying climate sensitivity was invented by a character called Michael Schlesinger in a paper in 1985. And once again, that adds another 17.7% to the uh, overstatement of global warming, taking those two together, we're now up to about a 70% generation of the central estimate. On we go. Next slide, that's it. And here you see that fundamental equation of rate of transfer, then it is all the glory. It simply says that the flux at a particular altitude is, a particular surface, I should say, is the emission, uh, the emissivity rather, or absorptivity at that surface, which is typically around about one. In the, in, the, in the Earth's surface and indeed at the at altitude, so we use it as one. There's a Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is uh, not shown sure there, but it's approximately 5.6704 times 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin, uh, sorry, it's watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power, and that's the, the constant derived originally by uh, Joseph Stefan, the only 
Slovene, after whom the equation has been named. It's proved 15 years later, so late last century, uh, sorry, late, late 19th century, by his Austrian pupil Ludwig Boltzmann, who later went on to commit suicide because he um, couldn't convince the world that atoms existed. But anyway, they did get this right. It was proved by reference to Planck's black body law. So there's the correct way of finding that first differential. Uh, where you do it at the same altitude, and then you get the incorrect way where they use the surface temperature against the uh, flux at altitude, which gives you this bastardized and exaggerated quantity. On to the next slide. Now here we do a little bit of simple calculation to show what the effect of that particular exaggeration is, and we find that instead of 3.2 Celsius of warming, I'm not going to get through these calculations, you can check them all later, they're very straightforward, uh, it's only 1.7 Kelvin of warming, and so we've already got an exaggeration which is very close to a doubling, uh, thanks to these three mistakes we've identified so far. On we go. Next slide, that's it. Now the, the next error is the exaggerated water vapour feedback. This is a question I've had from one or two of you today already. On we go. Next slide, that's it. Here you will see the predictions of the um, hot spot that should occur in the tropical mid-troposphere, a differential warming of two or three times uh, what is happening at the tropical surface, if and only if global warming is to blame. And you'll see this in several, first of all, it's in the IPCC 2007 report at the top there, Li et al. 2007 here, and the 2006 report for the US government on the right. Next slide. But in reality, there's the HADAC 2 measurements. It doesn't actually exist. Next slide. And you'll see, in fact, that in 73 models measured by Christie in 2013, they found that there was an overprediction of temperature at that altitude because they are wrongly imagining that there's a large concentration of water vapor going to happen there as the world warms. It is not happening. Next slide. And here is a paper from uh, David Douglas and Spencer and Christie and uh, this was also with Fred Singer, and Fred Singer is the main author of this, and it shows that once again the climate models at the top, and then the observations at the bottom. This shows a major failure of prediction of the water vapor feedback. Next slide. And there again is confirmation of it, this time in the ISCCP data. Now, not every data set shows this, but the NOAA water vapor project does, and there's increasing realization that this is the case. Next slide. And therefore, we can recalculate, and we find that if we halve the water vapor feedback, we should really remove it altogether, it's not there at the moment, but if we halve it, then your temperature comes down to just 1.5 Kelvin per WCO2. Next slide. And now the official fourth error, this is the big one. This is the one which, once we correct for it, allows the constraint of climate sensitivity to be the reasonable bound. And here again you see that slide with the 3.2 Kelvin this time shown on it, of this curve, and these very, very exaggerated feedback factors, that's our problem. How do we get those feedback factors below the green line there, which is roughly where process engineers would design an electronic circuit if they didn't want it to oscillate and they weren't sure about the component field operating conditions, they wanted stability. They would try to design in as little positive feedback as they could. Next slide. And here is the way the models do it. This is the way they use the feedback here. And you'll notice that the inputs are the changes in temperature. The initial change in temperature is the input. If there's no feedback, then that's the output. But then if it's the input, if there is a feedback loop, then you take that feedback and multiply it by the output, and that gives you the additional input, which is summed with the original input, and that gives you your final sensitivity. Next slide, here is how they should do it. They should do it, first of all, not using temperatures, but using fluxes, because that's what's driving all this. Secondly, if you are to implement correctly the equations of feedback, which are derived from electronic circuitry, specifically from Bode 1945, where Hansen 1984, Schlesen 1985, got them from, then you have to use the absolute value of the flux when you start, before you do any amplification, and you must not just use the delta as your input. 
This is a very big error on their part. It's a total misunderstanding of how feedback calculations are done. This is built in now to every kind of model. And then the amplifier is your direct forcing from CO2. And then, with your feedback loop, uh, that is amplified again in turn, and you get the final output. Next slide. We're now going to look at how you determine, when you've got your initial flux, F0 there, what is the factor that you multiply it by in order to get the final flux at the other end from which you can determine by the stefan Boltzmann equation what your climate sensitivity is. Well, there it is. And you will see here uh, how it's derived. You have, by definition, two simultaneous equations joined by the logical operator for conjunction at the top there. And from that, you can eliminate uh, F1 from both equations. That then gives you F equals F0 times mu, which is the amplification factor from the direct forcing, times, uh, divided by 1 over mu times beta, which is the transmission characteristic of amplification factor in the feedback circuit. And you can compare that with the way that they do it there. Superficially, it looks the same, but actually, it's very difficult because they're doing it with deltas and we're doing it with the absolutes. Next slide. So, here are the correct figures plugged in. And what you'll see, to your horror, is that exactly the same answer comes out at the bottom. So, where is this error? It's still a delta T of 1.5 Kelvin, just as we saw before. But look at the transmission characteristic. Instead of the 0.625, way up towards that discontinuity of 1, we have this 0.008310. It's below the 0.01, which is the ideal maximum limit for stability. Exactly as I would have expected when I first raised this problem. There is your answer. That comes right down. But if it doesn't make any difference to the final calculation of climate sensitivity, why does this matter? Well, in one respect, it does matter. Because if you were to use this equation to try to uh, calculate down what the values of beta would be from the limits that are given for climate sensitivity in the published journals in the CMIT-5, CMIT-3 or IPCC reports, you're going to get a far greater variance in the value of uh, beta than you would get if you did it in a different way. Can we go, this, this, I don't know, the way you were before, Back to where we were. That's it. Here you see the translation equations between the functions that you will find in Bode 1945, chapter 3, that mu beta, which is the equivalent of, of F, the feedback factor used in climate. You'll see how you calculate the one from the other, the same with mu, the same with beta individually. There are the values, again, this very low value uh, for mu beta, which is the equivalent of F. That's way, way, way down on that curve. Now, this is how it starts to matter. Next slide. What you do is you take the central calculations there, and then at the top, at where it says amplification factor beta, line three of that table, you, you take the two sigma variances in feedback factors published in Vial et al. 2013, the official integration of the model results of the CBIT-5 models. That's the official paper that does that. And they have a standard deviation for the total feedback factor of about 0.2. So you allow, so 0.2, that's right, so we're going to take two standard deviations, 0.4 in each direction. You calculate beta by taking the central value <coughs> and going 0.4 down or 0.4 up, and then you run the calculations through. And look what happens to climate sensitivity. The interval is now 1.3, 1.5, 1.7. Only 0.2 Celsius rather than 1.5 Celsius either side of the central estimate. Next slide. Well, you can nearly end now. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. There is one more error we need to look at. This <laughs> one I'm grateful to will happen for. Next slide. Here are the equations for line shapes. To, to work out just how much your forcing is actually going to be. And these are the equations they use sometimes with various charges attached to them in the models. As you will see, the one startling thing about these equations is there is no provision for any time delay in the excitation and de-excitation collisions of the photons with the CO2 molecules that set up the resonance in one of the vibrational nodes and give you the heat. And that is because in optical physics, from which these equations come, the time delay is not a great issue. 
In climate science, however, as Will Happer pointed out in a distinguished paper to the World Federation of Scientists this time last year, if you assume, as the models do, instantaneity in those equations, when in fact there's a delay of a few picoseconds in the uh, excitation and de-excitation, you in effect overstate climate sensitivity by 40% because you're overstating the, the rate of enforcement by 40%. Next slide, please. And here you can see the difference at the far wings of the line shapes between the uh, Lorentzian and Voigt equations and the equations as adjusted to allow for this time delay. Next slide. And that brings climate sensitivity down again uh, using the Happer sensitivity factor there. We divide the previous final sensitivity by 1.4 to allow for this factor. And then you get your final sensitivity for this program. You can see the exaggerated factors there. They nearly tripled the central estimate and considerably more than tripled the higher estimate of sensitivity. Next slide. The bottom line then is that climate sensitivity is, next slide, is roughly that. That is using their own arguments. I don't tell you that that figure is right. I suspect it's even less than this actually. But using their own arguments, correcting for those four errors that I have identified for you, that is how far climate sensitivity comes down. And all of those errors are undeniable. They can't say this is a, a misinterpretation or you're looking at one way or another. No. These are frank scientific errors in the quantification and determination of climate sensitivity. Next slide. The moral question, which uh, the Reverend Philip Foster very rightly raised, I want to end very briefly with this. Next slide. This is what happens even in the West if you have very heavy taxes on energy. This is a labour compared with the previous Liberal government in Australia a few years ago, done by a Liberal senator, so there may be a political angle to this, I wouldn't deny it, but nevertheless you can see what happens if you start putting these huge subsidies onto so-called green energy and then making the poor pay for them. It's a poll tax on the poor. Next slide. As you can see, there is a very good correlation between life expectancy in years versus CO2 emissions country by country. And if you look at the next slide, you will see that the child mortality per thousand born versus CO2 emissions, that goes the other way. So CO2 emissions are good for bringing poverty down, a point that, that Philip was adumbrating there. Next slide. And here is Africa's energy cycle. Energy source is timber, carried on the backs of the people, burnt in smoke-filled huts. And a UN report that came out just last year estimates that 2 million people a year die just from the smoke in those huts because they haven't got the facility to put the coal, which is abundant in Africa, into coal-fired power stations, generate the electricity cleanly that way, and then have power without having this ag agonising energy cycle they have now. And altogether, I suspect it's something like a holocaust every year. Six million people are dying out of the 1.2 billion who don't have electricity. Because we are faffing around, worrying about global warming, which I now declare a scare that is over. Yeah. Yeah. These, these errors are undeniable that they have made. There is no way back from this moment. You were here when it was finally exposed. Next slide. <laughs> These are the people to whom we owe an obligation to get our science right. Because if we get it wrong, they die. And if there is one purpose in this conference, it is that we have the moral sense that whatever it costs us in reputation, as our reputations are trashed by those who will not do the mathematics and will not do the science, and will only follow the party line, it is we who stand up here and say, we will not be moved, we will not have our free speech taken away, we will do our free scientific inquiry, we will draw what I believe are the correct conclusions, and we will present those conclusions to the world, and that will be the end of that. Thank you.
Start a new stream for the questions.